God bless you everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the gift series. I am excited to be back, especially after the wonderful session that we had last week. Wasn't it wonderful? It was brought to us by the manservant, Minister Luke Francis, who clearly explained why we need the Holy Spirit. It was an important session. The best thing about YouTube is that if you've missed any of the previous episodes, you can go back at any time to watch it. And I will give a recap on that session. But first, we're going to open up in prayer. Father God, my prayer today is that you help us to stir up this gift, is that you help us to fan into flame that abiding anointing of your spirit to work daily in our lives and in our ministries. And Lord, my prayer for those who've already received your gift is that we receive a double portion, twice the measure of anything we have ever experienced. I give greetings to my bishop, Bishop Dexter Edmund and the Board of Bishops. I give greetings on behalf of the Bethel National Youth Team. Youth, welcome. Those who are watching, welcome. Today's topic or today's question is, I have the Holy Spirit. What now? I am still in a high from the wonderful session last week. And so we're going to begin with a little recap. Last week, Minister Luke so eloquently answered the question, why do I need the Holy Spirit? He started off by delving into the necessity of the Holy Ghost. He said it guides us to righteousness and truth. He said that it enables us to do uh, the impossible. It helps us to understand God's word and his desire for us. He then looked at the power of the Holy Ghost. He said that God's power works through us and it exceeds man's ability, man's knowledge and, and intellect and that it is our helper. He then looked at how we must work on our relationship with the Holy Ghost daily, which is actually something we're going to look at uh, a little bit more today. He showed us a wonderful example in the images of the dirty room, of the dirty house. It was a space filled with rubbish. And Minister Lou asked the question, would God want to live in our house? Oh God. Or do we need to clean it up first? He then ended by looking into the flow of the Holy Ghost. He says, and we know it to be true, that the Holy Ghost moves without permission. It comes with confirmation and edification. And it allows us to understand how God speaks, how he moves, what is right, what is wrong, what we need to uh, learn and what we even need to unlearn. Today's session is really focused on those who have the Holy Spirit. One thing that I want to say, especially to those who have recently received, is well done. I'm saying well done, not congratulations, because in the in the last episode, as I said already, the Holy Ghost is not a prize to be won, but it is a gift. So well done for accepting and receiving. I am so proud and elated for you. But the question then comes, what now? And I believe as well that this is a question not only for those who have recently received, some may have received 20 or 30 years ago, as I've said, and the question still remains, what now? This session is also useful for those who have not yet received, because as we always like to do, we'll be breaking down some of the most common myths and misconceptions. So we'll be starting off by looking at the difference between indwelling and outflowing the internal and external workings of the Holy Spirit. Next, we'll be looking at whether having the Holy Spirit means that there are daily requirements that we have to meet. How do we yield? Next, we're gonna be looking at a question which even me, I am still, still learning through, we're learning together. Can you lose the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to quench the spirit, truly, we hear it so often. What does it mean? And then finally, we'll be looking at reactivation of the Holy Spirit through repentance. And this is for those who say, I am filled, but how do I recover if and when I fall? So 
as we delve into these questions today, make sure you have your pen and your paper at the ready. Feel free also to leave comments in, in the live chat, those who are watching live, leave comments. Um, you can even ask me questions in the, in the live chat and we will get round to it. As I said, and I will continue to emphasize, we are learning together. So I want to hear from you, amen. Okay, so in order for us to really answer the question today, I have the Holy Spirit, what now? We first have to look at the difference between indwelling and out flowing. That really is, that second one really is the what next. I have two scriptures here on the screen. The first one speaks of the indwelling. It's a scripture where they are in the upper room, taken from Acts 1 verse 8, where they are told that they will receive power and after that, the Holy Ghost will come upon them. In John 7 verse 38, we are told that out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. So let's look at what indwelling means. So this indwelling occurs when we first believe, when we first believe and receive. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit occurs at that moment, at that time when Jesus Christ comes into your life as your Lord and Saviour and he takes up permanent residence in you so long as you believe. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 and 20 says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, um, whom you have from God and that you are not your own for you are bought at a price and therefore you must glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So when God puts his Holy Spirit in you, he keeps it there until the redemption of the purchased possession. This means that a born again person is permanently indwelt so long as they believe, so long as they believe. Amen. But what then is outflowing? The outflowing really is the what next. Um, when we think about the scripture where, where we hear of the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well, and she encounters Jesus and Jesus asks her for a drink and she's confused. Jesus says that so long as people keep coming to this well to draw water and to drink, they will continually be thirsty. But he says, whoever comes to me, me as the source of their water continually, they will surely then build up a well that will spring. We also hear something similar in the book of John where it says, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. So surely what we need is the quickening influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Uh, it, need, it needs us, it requires us to keep visiting, keep going back to the well. And that's why it says in that scripture with the woman, it says drinketh and not drink. Drinketh, which is a present progressive, uh, does not suggest one completed act. It's not a drawing of a supply that would meet the need once and for all but it suggests the need of a constant drawing from the source. It suggests that we drink and we drink and we keep on drinking. And when that is done, what will God, God promised us? That he will provide within us a well from which there is a constant living flow, a well of water springing up, springing us up rather into everlasting life. And until we have actually come and have entered into that experience, we need to keep revisiting God. When you have just received the Holy Spirit, God has poured himself within you. You may receive power and the ability to do supernatural things, which is wonderful. But notice that when God has poured into you, it's still in the deepest part of your belly. But if you keep revisiting God and asking him for more water on top of your water, he will continue to pour and pour and pour until you reach this stage. This is where it becomes a spring. Now it's it's almost like a fountain. It's going to keep coming, going back out and in and out and in. An everlasting source. And that's why we really need to keep going back to the well. 
until we have this spring within us. And that is my encouragement to all those who have recently received the Holy Spirit. Don't let it go stagnant. Don't let it go dry. It does not stop here. Keep revisiting the source. Keep building on your faith. Keep revisiting God. Read your word. We're going to get into that in, 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 in just a little bit. But I really, really, really wanted to draw on this drinking because it's not as though it's a matter of us walking casually out into the rain and allowing it to fall on us simply like it falls on everybody or anybody who happens to be there. That is neither what is purposed or what is promised. It is something that we ourselves must seek actively, seek and pursue. There must be voluntary action on our part. First, a recognition of the need or a continual need, then a coming to the source of supply that we, um, to that need that we have met continuously continuously because once you've just received the holy ghost you're but a baby in god in that you have just been reborn into salvation you need to keep drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking until your well is strong enough to provide a living and continuous supply a continuous spring the songwriter says i keep going back to the well (laughs) <laughs> the greater the power, the sweeter the praise. And this is the key part. When temptation comes my way. And that's something we're going to actually visit later, which says I have the Holy Spirit, but how do I recover when I fall, when I fall into sin? My parents always tell me that prevention is always better than cure. And that's what the songwriter is saying. When temptation comes my way, I will just keep going back to the well. Instead of falling, I will just keep going back to the well. If you keep revisiting the well, it will keep you from falling. Isn't that what it says in the book of Jude? I think it's Jude. I hope it's Jude. If you keep going back to the well, it will keep you from falling. Don't count on yesterday's supply of the of your Holy Spirit. We need a new, fresh source supply of water until we have this spring in us so that's my encouragement to those specifically who have just received keep going back to the well it's going to get harder now that you've just received so keep going back to the well because if you don't you will fall but if you continue to drink and drink and drink and drink until you have an everlasting spring out of your belly rising up out of your mouth and that's why it says out of your belly and not out of your mouth because the mouth is the exit point but God pours into the deepest parts I said it already he pours into the deepest parts but the more he pours in the more he pours in surely it will rise and flow out keep going back to the well okay so we've already set ourselves up to answer this question that lays before us Are there daily requirements for being filled with the Holy Spirit? And the answer is a resounding yes. Yes, there are requirements. If you want to walk in the way of the Lord, if you want to walk according to the Holy Spirit, if you want to allow the Holy Spirit to move through you, there are daily requirements that you must meet. Throughout the Bible, there are four actions that are clear that these need to be daily requirements in the life of a believer in order to keep drawing from the well we need to adopt these habits we need to adopt these behaviors into our daily lives Um, but before I get into these daily requirements it's first imperative to say that in doing these actions daily that this is an act of burial in Romans 6 verse 2 and verse 10 it talks about how when a person comes to Christ they must die to sin they must be dead to sin and continue through their physical life as dead to sin. So the members of our physical body must be considered as, as it states in Colossians 3 verse 5, as dead to immorality, 
dead to impurity, to passion, to evil desire and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Uh, And at this point of conversion, the sinner is buried with him, buried with him through baptism into death. And, And what that means is, Uh, You can liken that to water baptism, that symbolic act of taking on the name of Jesus um, and accepting God as your personal saviour. But the Bible also describes being filled with the Holy Spirit as a burial or a baptism. Um, In this way, this death to sin must be a lifelong commitment, a continuing experience. I have on my screen here. Uh, a scripture taken from Luke 9 23 it says and he said to them all if any man will come after me let him deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me take up his cross daily and follow me to take up your cross is something that has to take place first in your thoughts when Thoughts that aren't pleasing to God come to your mind during the day. You have to put them to death on an inner cross. And that's what it means when it says take up your cross because you are about to sacrifice those thoughts. You are about to kill those thoughts. You are about to kill those actions, those temptations. Well, I say thoughts first because it manifests as thoughts first before they reside in your heart and become actions and behaviours. So it it says take up your cross daily because just like Jesus, you are sacrificing yourself, your human self, your flesh. You're sacrificing your flesh on a cross. You're dying. Your human self has to die daily just as Christ died on that cross in surrender. So I say thoughts first because, for example, a judging thought towards your friend crops up in your mind. A thought of judgment towards your friend crops up in your mind. It's a negative thought. Uh, Perhaps even a grumbling thought of dissatisfaction for what you have to do today. As these thoughts come up in your mind, you can choose, you can choose to deny them. And that is what it means where it says, deny yourself, take up your cross. You can choose to deny these thoughts. Your mind stands guard at the door of your heart and you get to decide what comes through. You get to decide what comes through your your heart's door. When a sinful thought pops up in your mind, uh the first time it is only a temptation a suggestion but you can choose to deny that thought to access your heart in practice that means that as soon as you become aware of the thought you have to disagree with it you have to discard it you have to choose not to dwell on it you have to choose to do nothing about it so that it doesn't manifest into something tangible remember it's not a sin to be tempted it's a, it manifests into sin when you fall into temptation. There is a choice. There is a choice. So take up your cross. And this scripture says daily, daily, put those thoughts before they become behaviours on a cross. Sacrifice them. Deny them. Deny yourself, your human self, your flesh. Daily. And we're coming back to that song as as I'm even talking, the song that says, keep going back to the well. Because as I said before, prevention is better than cure. It says, I keep going back to the well when temptation comes my way. All you have to do is keep going back to the well. How do you go to the well? As I said already, the well is living water. living, And that's why it's called living water. Because when you are dying, daily it is the living water that will revive you it is the living water that will resuscitate you that will raise you like it raised jesus 
So let's get into the first point, humbly and expressively approach God through prayer. Um, and you can fast as well, but these are daily requirements. I'd say that prayer specifically is a daily requirement. I've said humbly and expressively. Let me tell you why. Let's start off with humbly. Here, I'm talking about when you wake up in the morning, when you lay your head to rest, when you're about to take food, when you're about to leave your house, humbly approach God through prayer, humbly. When Jesus was here on earth, he leaned on God, he prayed to God. When he rose early in the morning, when he went throughout his day, he prayed to God. I say humbly here because we have to make time to reverence who God is. And for those, I must say this actually, for those who are new in the faith or for those who have recently received the Holy Spirit and you're thinking, well, I don't know how to pray. What does it even mean to pray humbly? I would say to take your cue from the scripture that says, our father which art in heaven. If you know that prayer, there you'll find is a structure for how you can pray humbly. How you can pray humbly. The scripture starts off by acknowledging who God is, his sovereignty. Our father which art in heaven. In other words, you could say, my God in heaven, who is majestic. God, you are holy. God, you walk in righteousness. God, you are good. Acknowledge who he is. Acknowledge his sovereignty. Acknowledge his standing. Acknowledge his goodness. After you've understood um, and, and acknowledged him, thank him. God, I thank you for what you are doing. I thank you for what you have done. And I thank you for what you're about to do. I humbly come before you in gratitude. Once you have thanked him, then put forward your request. And I have to say as well, sometimes when I'm praying, I don't have anything to ask. Sometimes it's just, God, I just wanted to tell you that I love you. God, I just wanted to tell you that you're good. God, I just wanted to say hello. <laughs> but when you put forward your request, you may say, oh God, I'm praying and asking you, Lord Jesus, to show me your will. God, help me to understand this thing that I do not understand. Lean on him, lean on him, put your petition towards him. And after you have done those three things, end your prayer acknowledging that you know his name. Call him by his name. When you have a relationship with somebody, you know them. You don't just know of them, you know them. So you can call them by name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You can pray, pray those kind of prayers when you wake up in the morning. Pray humbly. When you leave your house, pray humbly. When you go to sleep, pray humbly. But I've also said, here I've said also expressively. Let me tell you why. When I made the decision to move to uni uh, seven years ago now, I'm still studying, studying and studying, forever student, I told you this. <laughs> when I made the decision to move to university, I moved to the other side of the country. I moved to Surrey. And I made the decision to live alone. No housemates live on my own because, let me tell you why, because I'm an extroverted introvert, which means I absolutely love people's company. I love doing stuff like this and speaking to audiences, but I really value my own time and space. I love to be on my own. You'll often find me in a room of my own somewhere, reading in silence, studying, uh, researching something new, painting or doing something creative. I love my own space. So I decided to live on my own. When I did that, I found that, you know, going to university, speaking to people, every evening I would come back to silence. I would be met with silence, which I often enjoyed. Sometimes, if I'm being so honest, sometimes you would, I would find that I was, I felt lonely. I had no one to talk to, there was silence in the house. Um, and it really prompted me to pray. That's why I'm sharing this testimony because I, I learned the importance of prayer and having a secret place. I really learned that importance. And that this is why I say here expressively because in those days throughout my day, I would just talk to God 
really relaxed and informal, like I'm talking to you right now, I would say, God, what tea should I drink today? Like, which one's going to wake me up? Or God, I have been working through this idea for my research. What do you think? Just having an informal conversation, because that's what relationship is all about. Consulting God on the things that may seem minor to you. May seem minor to you. Yes, he is my king, but he's also my brother and my friend. Yes, he is. And so you can pray to him expressively. It can be a two minute prayer. It can be less than that. Just asking God a quick question. I must say as well that when you are praying to God, remember that it is a conversation and not a lecture. A conversation requires participation from two people. God must respond. Make sure you li- you're leaving him time and space. We like to call things intuition and fate and and and, and stuff like that and just say, oh, I had a feeling. No, it was God. There is nothing by coincidence. God, it's always by God's happenings. And acknowledge that. Thank you, God. Ah, I'm going to choose that. Thank you, God. So that's what I mean when I say humbly and expressively approach God through prayer. That is one way to keep drawing from the well. The next thing I want to say is obediently submit yourself to the will of God. This one is, of course, a hard one. This one is, of course, a hard one. Actually, let me revisit the first point about prayer. Um, Because I've been thinking about Psalms 91. I've been discussing Psalms 91 with my mom. It says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So find a secret place dwell there we're talking about indwelling god indwelling himself in us but we need to dwell as well in him so it's two ways but let's get on to the second point obediently submit yourself to the will of, to the will of god each day or every day we are faced with the temptation of satisfying our own flesh and going outside of the boundaries of god's perfect will for us to submit to our will and we really have to stop and consider the things that we do and to appraise them by saying, this thing pleases me, but does it please God? This thing satisfies me, will it satisfy God? And if you're wondering what is God's will for me, you can pray and ask him, but you can also find God's will for his children throughout the Bible, read his word, It's hard to do, but um, obediently submit yourself to it. The second thing which leads very well on, very well into is sending up praises and worship. Now, this is, this is fun. I mean, I love to praise and worship. I'm a a, a praise and worshiper. I love to sing. I love to, to worship as many would already know. You can do this throughout your day by just listening to music, which honors God. And I say that some on here may not agree, but I am a firm believer that what we consume is important. What we choose to consume is important. It sets up how we think about our days. It sets up the the foundation of our mind for our for our day. What you listen to, what you decide to talk about with others, what you decide. To, to, to do on a daily basis, where you decide to go, in those ways, in honouring your walk with God, you can send up praise and worship to him. The final point I want to say is serve, uh, serve and love others. Serve and love others. There are 10 commandments that we have to, in order to work, work, walk worthy, we have to <laughs> obey 10 commandments, but There are two which go strongly together. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul. And this is the one that a lot of people find difficult. And love your neighbour as yourself. Why do these two commandments go hand in hand? Why do I say that? Because you cannot say that you love God if you do not love your brother. You cannot say that you honour and love God if you hate your friend or even hate your enemy. God says to love your enemy. Jesus did it. And on the reverse, you cannot say, you cannot truly love your neighbor if you do not love God, because God is love. He teaches us how to love others. So love, 
others, serve others, do, do something nice, meet the needs of others. Now we're coming on to a question which I'm sure many if not all believers have asked in one stage of their life. Can you lose the Holy Spirit? And what does it mean to quench? The Bible says quench not the spirit. What does that mean? So in order to understand these two points, losing the Holy Spirit and quenching not the spirit, the possibility of losing the spirit and quenching not the spirit, we have to understand that the Bible makes a separation. There are the believers. So those who have been filled and are a believer can deactivate the spirit. They cannot essentially lose the spirit, but they can deactivate the spirit. And we're going to go on to uh, exploring what, what exactly that means. But the Bible talks about and describes the infilling of the Holy Ghost as God being a, taking up permanent residence so long as you believe. Taking a permanent residence so long as you believe. So Whilst believers can deactivate the spirit, what about the ungodly? Now, as I said before, the ungodly are those who turn away. They are not the sinners who who never knew God and never believed in his word. These are the ungodly who once believed and believed no more. Can you lose the Holy Spirit? Let's look into this. Let's start with the word quench. So we're focusing now on the believer. Those who do believe, they have the the Holy Spirit and they do believe. Let's look at the word quench. It means to extinguish in ways to put out or to dampen down or to stifle and suppress a feeling. We would rather use the word quench in the way of the second definition, to stifle or suppress a feeling, to quench uh, the feeling, the movement of the Holy Spirit. But I'm really interested in the first definition, which means to extinguish, to put out, to dampen down, to dampen down. Now, when we think about those who are filled with the Holy Spirit and are a believer, what happens when they uh, choose to not follow God's word? What happens when they momentarily walk in darkness? What happens when they have short-sighted faith? What happens when they start to doubt? They are filled, but they are doubting. What happens? Does God remove his spirit from them? No, the Bible speaks about how we can, in many ways, it describes us as being able to deactivate the spirit. I see it like this, before we get on to what's already on this slide, I see it like this. It's like a mobile phone. Imagine your mobile phone is the gift that was given, the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given. Now, if my mobile phone, and I'll just get it, right now my mobile phone is on, but if my phone is switched off, if my phone is switched off, oh, there's the camera. <laughs> I still have the gift, but it's of no use to me because it's not activated. If I need to call someone, I, I don't have the authority or ability. Ah, I don't have the authority or ability to make that call because my phone has not been activated. So in those ways, we can say that a believer can deactivate their faith. And I would describe it as like a power outage. Have you ever been in a house where all of a sudden the lights in the streets just cut off? Or maybe it's just in your house, lights just cut off. Um, and you are trailing through the darkness. You'll find that when you have a power outage in your house or in your street, that you are now unable to see clearly. You are be able, you're unable to see clearly the, the direction in which you need to walk or, or need to go. And you're relying on your own strength and your own power, which is a failing power because you're in the middle of darkness. It's a place where darkness is a place where you often can get lost. It's a place where you often feel powerless and purposeless. In the book of, I believe it's in James 4, it says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. So when you decide not to do 
uh, those daily requirements, when you choose to quench the spirit, God pulls away from us. Our spirit does, our power does not go, but it is deactivated. We are forced to depend, as I've already said, on our own might, power and strength, which is, which is a failing strength, a failing power, a failing power. So if electricity cannot, and I use this example of power outage, because when I think of a light bulb, we know that that connectivity that's creating that spark is like fire. And so that's why I like, I'm likening this. I thought it was the best example to describe this when talking about the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit should flow like a river, but its power is like fire. Its power is like fire. And we just, we don't want it to be like a flickering candle. We want it to be a consuming fire we want it to be a blazing fire when we ignore the leadership of the holy spirit we lose our closeness to god and we have a power outage we have a power outage when we do not forgive other people there are many christians who are not serving as powerfully as they should and and could because they have not forgiven someone it's not that god has removed his spirit from us it's that we have failed to activate it in some circumstances, we may be navigating through life and be hit at every angle and wondering what's happening because we are in a moment of fear, we're in a moment of doubt. And in that moment, we have not activated our spirit to intervene for us. So we come to the reality now. We know the Bible in many different verses tells us that God will not dwell in an unclean vessel. If you backslide from God, and I'm talking about a complete turn, you no longer believe in God. You're no walk, no longer walking and committing yourself uh, to the way of the righteous. You are submitting to your flesh. And remember when you submit to your flesh, holy now as a lifestyle or as a daily uh, activity you cannot be under submission of the spirit god does not dwell in an unclean vessel we're now talking about those who no longer believe remember i said earlier that god takes up permanent residence permanently indwells so long as we believe and so you can deactivate if as a believer but once you turn away from god your spirit does, the Holy Spirit does not stay, it does not uh, keep residence there. And we can look into, let's look into scripture. There are some scriptures here on the screen which you can go away and look into for more on that. But Hebrews 10 verse 38 says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And then there's another scripture, uh, it is, this is the one, Luke 9 verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So God's spirit will continue to reside in you so long as you believe and try your endeavour best to live the way of the righteous. There'll be times you may slip, there'll be times you may deactivate your spirit, but if you really don't want God to take his spirit away from you, you have to continue to be a believer. You have to continue to be a believer. You have to continue to follow his word. You have to continue to be subject to, to uh, his commandments. This is what the word of God says. And as I've said already, there are many other scriptures on the screen if you want to go away and look into that more. We're coming to the last point, which is an encouraging one, I hope, that reactivation through repentance is possible. Remember we spoke about deactivation of the Holy Spirit. We spoke about that in the case of the believer. And those who are filled may be saying, how do I recover if or when I fall? The answer is, repentance how do we repent we must first have a godly sorrow for our sin we must feel the weight of our sin we must feel moved by our sin we must feel grieved by our sin genuine sorrowfulness um, and then we must confess our sin name it tell it to god be truthful and honest about what it is that you have done 
And then this is the difficult one that many don't seem to understand. Turn from sin. And it doesn't mean that you do, you stop doing it for a while. It's you make an active commitment to turn completely away from sin and to rededicate yourself to a life of holiness, to a life that is pleasing to God, to the way of the righteousness, choosing holiness every day. That's how you turn. And so really and truly repentance or reactivation through repentance isn't just for those who have the Holy Spirit but have deactivated it because they weren't in tune with the Spirit one day. This also goes to those who have turned away from God, who no longer believe. Repentance is the next step to draw you back to God. This is also to the sinner who has never yet believed. Repentance is the way to draw you to God. Repentance. You need to say, I'm sorry, Lord, for the things that I've made it when it should have always been about you and is always about you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me on this session where the question came, I have the Holy Spirit. What now? And as I said before, this is for those who are newly saved, those who haven't activate, reactivated their spirit in a while. There are steps for us to do. We've spoken about the differentiation between indwelling and outflowing. We spoke about the daily requirements, which is something that I hope you will revisit because we're all on a journey. I can definitely say for myself, I am on a journey to get stronger in my faith, to be a better Christian, to have more anointing and to walk in more anointing each and every day. We also spoke about quenching the spirit deactivation and the possibilities of even losing the spirit and we spoke about reactivation through repentance same time next week we are back with minister luke francis he'll be talking about gifts which is a very important subject because many are who have especially those who've just been filled are confused about their gifts and may have questions so please join minister luke join us next week uh, minister luke will be talking about gifts. Thank you so much for joining me um, for this episode. I am looking forward to seeing you back here same time, same place next week. God bless you all.